Hey everyone, it's Crypto Dantes here. Quick word from our sponsor. Yes, we have a sponsor. It's an independent author named Chris Hannon who's penned an absolute cracker of a novel. It's called Orca Rising and it's the acclaimed first book in a spy thriller trilogy shortlisted for the People's Book Prize. People are comparing it to the likes of Hunger Games and The Maze Runner. If you enjoyed those, you're going to love Orca Rising. So check it out. That's O-R-C-A Rising, Orca Rising on Amazon. And you can also buy it directly from the author himself. That's csjhannon.com slash crypto. C for crypto, S for sugar, J for J, hannon.com slash crypto. And Orca Rising can be yours for just 150,000 sats. Get it now before the price goes up. I'm in before the film writes. Hi, everyone. It's Dan Jeffries. Let's crypto and grill. everyone let's crypto and grill it's crypto dantes here with stig of the pump stig how are you i am pretty excited actually pretty excited i'm trying to channel the future me and think how i'm going to feel in the future about the podcast that we're about to have and the guests that we've got on today (laughs) um i've already embarrassed myself beforehand so uh let's move on swiftly no, you're, you're, it's very endearing, your, fan, your fanboy status uh, of our current <laughs> guest. So, um, look, before, uh, without further ado, let's introduce him. Um, yeah, it's somebody that I'm, I'm excited to talk to as well. It's the sort, of, the sort of conversation that I hope we can have today is the kind of thing that I have, uh, I talk to myself in my car about. Um, nobody else will talk to me about it because they think I'm a complete lunatic and uh, <laughs> on a different planet. Um, I will. I will. Yeah, good. So look, our, our guest today is, uh, I think he, he would refer to himself as a futurologist. Some people say that he invented the DeLorean and wears self-tying shoes. It's Dan Jeffries. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me on the show. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much for coming. So uh, Dan, um, let's start at the beginning. Um, it'd be great to understand just a bit more about you and just for our listeners, just for, for context, who you are, what you do on a day-to-day basis and just your your story. So I've been an engineer for 20 years, uh, particularly in the open source movement. Uh, I worked at uh, my own consulting company and where I did a lot of early Linux things. There was a recruiter back in the day who uh, told me that I should definitely be concentrating on, on Solaris. And I told him that it wouldn't exist in a decade. And he looked at me like I had two heads. And then I wanted to get into this uh, crazy Linux thing. That's been particularly productive for me. Um, I'm also a science fiction writer. That's what I really love to do. I have four novels out at this point in time. And I'm working on a fifth one that I'm pretty excited about. And I am also a professional uh, blogger and podcaster myself. The blog has been particularly uh, successful in the last couple of years. Mostly I write about future technology, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, and I try to do it from a more expansive place, whereas a lot of folks write about just the basics of crypto, you know, how to set up a wallet, those types of things. I try to think more about where all these things are going. And lastly, I do advanced architectural design for various crypto projects that are in stealth mode. So I'll work on gamified money, uh, governance protocols, um, lots of different ways to uh, do things that people are not really thinking about as long as they're doing some type of sci-fi level moonshot Then I'm interested. Amazing. Okay, so let's uh, let's rein it back a little bit because I think there's probably maybe 10 to 12 episodes that we could uh, fill based on what you've just said there. Um, so let's uh, let's go back. I'm, op- I'm open to 12 episodes if you guys want to do it. Let's go. <laughs> so I mean. Let, nice. we've, okay. we've we've got just under we've got just under an hour really um let's cover um the start of humanity through to where humanity could go we can do that in an hour right so we're beginning of time beginning of time now. up until the end of we've time got this 
Let's do it. Yeah, we got it. So look, one of your let's kick off uh, one of your articles um, that's really interesting on on uh, it's either Medium or Hack Noon or so I think people can can find it online. It's um, it's a really interesting beginning point for for Bitcoin and for crypto, and you start to talk about the um, importance of accounting um, and and you know how that and there there, there are these fun fundamental foundational levels that humanity sort of needs to go through and, and it started to go through them and Bitcoin is the natural uh, progression to some of that um, and then there's the stages beyond that how does all that kick off well the most important thing is when you look at the history of accounting there's only been two breakthroughs up until now and most people don't look at the history of accounting. It seems pretty boring, but accounting is the foundation of how we do everything in society. It's how we keep track of value. It's how we trade things. It's how we buy and sell. Uh, when you look at the first uh, iteration of accounting, it was essentially a single entry. So if I have a, a ledger and I say Bob owes me 50 bucks, the big problem with that is that if I wipe out that single line, then Bob doesn't owe me 50 bucks anymore, or nobody knows that Bob owes me 50 bucks. So at that point in time, we had just progressed from the hunter-gatherer stage to a more feudal system. And you really only did business with uh, a local sort of tribe or with a um, kings and queens and their, their various vassals. You needed to know your accountant very well. It was typically going to be your brother or somebody who was very close to you, tied by sort of filial blood because if that person wasn't trustworthy and they decide to wipe out that single entry in the ledger, then you're in big trouble. It just doesn't exist. There's literally no record of it. So what ended up happening is uh, society progressed at that point for a long period of time. And then you get to the 1400s, 1500s, you have various developments in double entry accounting, several different cultures developed double entry accounting, but it was really the Venetians that codified it. It was, I uh, believe, a Franciscan friar who finally put it down. And the Venetians were trading with lots of people around the world. You had the development of ships that could move around the world, and suddenly goods and services are flowing. And they need a way now to do business with people that they don't know or people that they only know on a limited basis. And so double entry accounting was really the answer to that. And I have a debit and you have a credit. In other words, we both have an entry in our accounts that is – either side of the transaction. And that actually is still the accounting system that's dominant to this day. If you're using QuickBooks or a uh, Fortune 500 company is doing their uh, accounting, those are still the practices that they're using. It's a double entry accounting system. It really hadn't evolved much beyond that. Society continued to evolve in terms of goods and services, in terms of us being able to do all kinds of things with it. However, we've started to see the cracks in that system. And you see things like um, it being able to be uh, gamed, like with Enron, where they're cooking the books, right? So there is a security violation if, if you're a big corporate entity that has a lot of power and I have access to your books. I never get to actually see whether you've issued the proper shares or whether you're doing the accounting properly or whether you're washing the money. And I have no way to really verify it other than us coming in after the fact and punishing them if we discover malfeasance. But we can't actually detect malfeasance during the beginning of it. So triple entry accounting is is really started with, uh, with Bitcoin, and that was the idea of having a third-party ledger. So now if I issue a share and I say, you know, good fellow, it looks like you have uh, – I'm going to give you 10% of the shares. You don't really know in a double entry accounting system whether you have 10% of the shares. But with a third entry, you do. You can look and say, okay, you know, uh, there's 10 million shares. Uh, I have a million of them. Therefore, I actually have 10% and I still don't have access to your books. Uh, I still am able to maintain that security, but the third entry in the ledger uh, allows me to validate it independently. And that third entry in the ledger, that ledger technology, which people are calling blockchain, but which I think is limiting in terms of it. It's a, a ledger technology or decentralized consensus is the overarching uh, abstract, whereas blockchain is just an iteration of it. It's like the caveman's fire of this. But this allows us to do a number of different things in tracking value across the world, and it's going to radically change how society works over the next hundred years. Got it. Okay. 
So one, of, so one of the key points I think also to overlay in what you've just run through as well is that for that period of time where double entry accounting existed, you had to have an independent authority that sat above the two because I couldn't write something in my ledger a million miles to the other side of the world and you write the same in yours and no one be the authority that validated that what was done was correct or accurate. Well, you, did have, you didn't necessarily have a third party looking over both of the ledgers. In other words, it was really just like a receipt that yeah. you and I had that the transaction took place. So it's basically based on a dispute methodology rather than a methodology where we can validate and then fix a dispute. So in the, in the, later, in the later stages, if I say, look, I, I paid you 100 bucks and you didn't give me my goats. You're like, well, I, my ledger says I did give you the goats and y your ledger says you did me the 100 bucks. But we haven't necessarily, we have to now go to like a court system, a centralized court system or, or something like that in order to, to deal with the dispute. But the mm -hmm. rise of court systems comes from uh, that development as well. Without the law and without a, a system of law, we can't actually. Um, we can't actually validate disputes between people that we don't know. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's whereas in the past it might just be you go to the king and the king says, "Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, validate the dispute." And I'm just going to, if I have time on my calendar, I'm going to split the baby. Okay. So let's fast forward to today. So we now, or to 2009, we have Bitcoin. Bitcoin's live. Um, what problem does it solve? And is it a panacea for, for all of the previous accounting uh, challenges? And does it effectively really revolutionize the accounting system and, uh, and, and take away the, central, the need for central authorities in terms of accounting, finance uh, and money? Or is that just uh, a narrative that the, the Bitcoin community and crypto community has spun up? Well, I think it is a narrative. I think everything is always somewhere in between. I don't think anything is a panacea. I think whenever you have a new invention, it unlocks both good and evil. It unlocks both good and bad things. It's going to have wonderful developments for society. We might be able to track uh, um, all of our foodstuffs in a much better way. So we won't, you know, it's going to be much harder to get tainted shrimp funneled through some, you know, grown on pig shit in China and then you know, routed through some place in uh, Vietnam or a third, you know, world country where there's only one guy with a stamp basically getting paid off, right? These types of things are going to be harder to uh, to pull off. We're going to know comprehensively where a lot of the things exist in the world, especially as you start having uh, facial recognition or just object recognition. If you start getting into the Neil Stevenson level metaverse where you've got the ability to scan and track objects across the world and then validate those automatically on a blockchain, these types of things are going to be wonderful in terms of transparency. We're going to have an amazing amount of transparency in terms of finances, corporate finances. For a very long time, it's going to be challenging to uh, discard malfeasance or to hide malfeasance. Of course, over time, humans are very ingenious uh, and they will begin to find the cracks in the system just as they did in double entry accounting. And they'll find all the loopholes and the ways to exploit it. And eventually there'll be, you know, quadruple entry accounting, whatever the hell that is. I have no idea what, what technology would, would validate that or even what kind of society would need something like that or even what it would look like. But eventually humans are, you know, will always find the cracks in the machine. However, it does open a lot of amazing things. And on the flip side, it also opens a potential for a surveillance society if we're not careful, right? So a lot of people are of the mindset that you know, Bitcoin and things like that are anonymous. That's ridiculous. In fact, blockchain forensics is now a thing. It makes it tremendously easy. I just uh, did a podcast with the CEO, uh, Eric Voorhees of Shapeshift, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a Wall Street Journal article that had come out about them that was kind of a hit piece saying that they were – you know, laundering money. And he was saying, this is maybe the dumbest way to launder money of all time. We publish every single transaction on the website and the API for everyone to see. Like, <laughs> like investigators laugh at it in forensic accounting. Like it was a ridiculous article. Yeah. And so now you're actually starting to see the rise of of technologies like ZK Snarks, right, or, or Mimblewimble, which I've been obsessed with recently, where there are no addresses and it, it looks like everything is a Tumblr where they're trying to now do things like uh, mimic cash in the digital world, right? Uh, because people think, well, 
Yeah, like if cash were invented now, it would be totally illegal. My friend is kind of f- fond of saying in the Polish government, and she, and she's right. And by the way, cash will be illegal probably within ten to twenty years. We've already seen moves towards it in India, where they just moved too fast. They invalidated all the bills uh, at a certain level, and people were just waiting in line. The poor were really affected by it. But make no mistake, cash is going away. I went to Hong Kong recently. I was using the Octopus card which started as just a, a thing to ride the subway, and then all of a sudden you could use it in all the bodegas and everywhere else to buy things with just a touch, and you load up cash on it. Mostly cash is gone already, but if we, don't, if we are not careful, what we're going to have is panopticon money. We're going to have a centralized currency that, you know, if you think that the Internet is a surveillance state now and knows – who, you know, who you're seeing and where you went last night and when you buy coffee and at what time during the day, now every single transaction that you do is, is going to be tracked and tax collection is just going to be a script. And you, and you know where and you know where the evolution of this becomes kind of scary is when people like the IMF, which I think they released a blog, uh, someone from the IMF released a blog last week, which basically said that they were they recommended that using you, we use negative interest rates as they increase over the globe over the next economic crisis to phase out cash into what they called e-cash. But basically for me, that is pretty much create, creating an issue with an issue. Right. And by the way, there's a lot of things we could do with a fully sci-fi Star Trek level system where you have both centralized cash and you have uh, decentralized cash acting as a, a point counterpoint in a balancing system. And you could do things like, let's say we always have in the United States, we always have this debate over the minimum wage. And so what ends up happening is we create a minimum wage at seven bucks and then it stays that way for 20 years before it's ever addressed again, which is well beyond the standard of living. And then all of a sudden we come in and we go, well, what should it be now? We go, I don't know, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 15 bucks. We just pull a number out of our ass. We pass a law and we change the minimum wage to that. And and there's this big shock to the system as businesses scramble to deal with it. Uh, And um, it, it, so let's let's take for instance, and I, I hate politics, so I'm not I'm not actually taking the stance. I'm going to take it as a thought experiment. But let's say that we think that the minimum wage is a good idea. If I actually have an, a futuristic system of real time economics, where I'm actually have little AI watchers looking at all the dynamics within the system, how much spending is being done, where all the goods and services are coming in, the boats are flying all around the world. I know exactly what's on those shipping containers, how much are shipping. It's no longer something where you know, Venezuela can be like, well, we're just going to cook the numbers and decide we shipped this much and we didn't, right? It's like, it's going to be invalidated by the fact that you have these little constant statistics, real-time statistics. And you could be looking at those statistics and automatically ingest the minimum wage at set intervals, uh, higher or lower. Now, you could you could cushion it by saying, okay, Maybe it only fluctuates by 2% within a shorter period of time. Maybe it gets readjusted over a longer period of time, five years or 10 years, based on real economic statistics that allow businesses to grow and change. Now, of course, this could be based on crappy politics, too, and we could have a horrible algorithm. Algorithms are not infallible, but it's entirely possible to think of a good algorithm that could potentially adjust this kind of thing for us and make better decisions for us. Or think about an artificial intelligence that's able to look at budgeting issues. It's able to look at all the allocations for roads and street systems and things of that nature. It would do a much better job at allocating those budgets than essentially old men in suits horse trading about whether like we get a road in you know, Charleston, South Carolina versus New York, if you let me open an egg farm and I let you pass the bill on abortion. You see what I mean? Like none of th- this is all, th- these are all, these are all nonsense when you look at something like the Hong Kong subway AI, which directs the engineers with predictive uh, failure rates as to what to do next as opposed to, well, I think this street has a pothole. I think I'll go over there. Like if the, if the artificial intelligence are allocating the budgets and they're allocating what things are doing and we're able to track all this stuff in real time, I think you have a much more efficient and less wasteful society, provided we don't screw it up. But I'm not always confident that humans won't screw it up. We're pretty good at doing it. I, I know my friend wants to ask a question because he always does. But one of the points there that I – so do you think then by creating this infrastructure, you could create the ability for humans to – to increase their exponential capability by the ability to actually just even allocate resources more effectively. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, every every single time that we abstract up the stack or we do we have these new inventions, we do actually become more efficient. My friend Chris Dixon from Andreessen Horowitz is, uh, often talks about the WhatsApp effect, where they built you know, 100 million user application with 50 engineers. Now, some people look at that and they go, oh, my God, like we're losing all the jobs. And, you know, and 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 to some degree that they're right, you have these shocks of job losses. But we've all we've destroyed the jobs, all of the jobs historically, you know, many times in history. Right. It's like, did you guys tan leather? you know, before you, you came to the podcast and like make your own clothes. Like, you know, did you hunt a Buffalo this morning? And like, and then like, I've had a make busy day. Food? I've had a busy day. Dan. Yeah. I don't know about you. I've done all of those yeah. things this morning. Right. So, right, before, yeah. right, before, <laughs> right before Starbucks. Right. Yeah, you got that. Exactly. And then, right. And then you sang songs around the campfire and all this stuff too. Right. So, and then after that, you built your own house, right. With the guys from the neighborhood, like you chopped down your own trees. Like, again, we, we've, we, you know, for a long time, we were just hunter gatherers. That was everyone's job. And then we were all farmers. And then all of a sudden, over you have industrialization and specialization. We're going to have increased specialization. We're going to have increased ability to be creative. We're going to have increased efficiencies. It doesn't mean all this stuff is good. I've always tried to be very balanced in my writing and, and alert people to the fact that there's always a dark underbelly to these things. If, if you're not thinking about it in the crypto community, you can bet your ass that the bad guys are thinking about it. Every body who thinks, that centralized powers, everyone that they're afraid of in the crypto community is not looking at this technology, that they're laughing at this technology are wrong. They are dead wrong. They are looking at this technology. They're patenting the shit out of it. They're secretly studying it, how they can corrupt it and how they can utilize it for their own purposes. I guarantee you we will have centralized cryptos and centralized uh, tracking technologies and ledgers and all of these types of things. And a lot of people will say, you know, those aren't crypto because they're not decentralized. You know, you say tomato, I say tomato. I don't give a crap what you call it. They are going to build centralized versions of this shit with checkpoints that they control, guaranteed, 100%. Count me. You could go you, back and look at this podcast in 20 years. Guarantee I'm right on it. But do, yeah. you, but do, you, not, do you not think that then the Darwinism effect of evolution, uh, because all of this, everyone's becoming more intelligent about everything to do with this kind of stuff. Do you not think there will just be a natural evolution away from that centralized set of infrastructures that may provide the interim world but people will know that actually it, you're better off and get better value, for instance, transacting on Grin or Beam. I know you talked about Mimble Mimble, but like uh, you get, it's better for you, basically. It's slowly weaning yourself away from it. Do you think there will be that natural evolution? Well, I don't think that centralization or decentralization are necessarily good or bad. In fact, I talked about this in my pod, in my talk in Hong Kong for Blockstack at the t their Decentralizing the World Tour. And I said that history is a pendulum. And it's a pendulum between closed and open, uh, between, uh, you know, centralized and decentralized. Both centralization and decentralization have their pluses and minuses. It is only extreme centralization or extreme decentralization where a society has essentially become largely sick. And I think what we have now is extreme decentralization. So you take something like Equifax that loses half the data in the United States. They're still trusted. In fact, they're making money of it. They're not punished at all. They, they're still processing our sensitive data. They have satellite companies that we now all have to subscribe to because you know, we have to make sure that it's, our shit's being tracked on the dark web and whatever. It's, it, they, are, they made money of it. They're a cancerous node in an extremely centralized system. They cannot be ripped out. Some of my work recently has been about developing uh, federated companies or federated systems that almost act as load balancers with a protocol, a deliberate protocol for collapsing corrupt nodes, reconstituting the company, that type of thing. But this type of stuff hasn't really been thought about. It hasn't been done yet. And so these are the problems with extreme centralization. So when that happens, the pendulum gets too far to one side and starts to swing in the other direction. So we're definitely swinging back towards the benefits of decentralization. I think that the ideal society is one that is balanced between centralized and decentralized, right? The centralized nodes act as filters on the most egregious things. And the decentralized nodes are able to be where the innovation is and you, each leaf node is able to spawn its own leaf nodes. But one of the problems of ex when you get to the other side of the pendulum is this sort of extreme decentralization is there is no way to kind of fully coordinate in a crisis or everyone move in a direction. We saw this as um, as sort of the challenge in the a good example I always use is the American Civil War, right, where the the big central northern powers 
federal powers were, uh, you know, slow and they were getting outmoded by guerrilla warfare and the genius of, of Southern generals, right? And then all of a sudden at one point when they finally got their shit together up north and they just like, let's just send a bazillion people down south and just like cut through everything. Then at the point, then all of a sudden you have the problem of decentralization where Virginia's like, Hey, Georgia, I got a, I got a problem over there. And they're like, you're on your own, dude. I, I got my own problems. Right. And there's no, there was nobody to be like, you know what? Everyone has to send their army here because it's, it's fully volunteer. So there's no, there is no perfect thing. Decentralization mm -hmm. is not inherently good. Decentralization is not inherently bad. They both have their pluses and minuses, just like a sphere mm -hmm. is a, is perfect for sort of, uh, balance in terms of its shape and, and pushing energy off of it. And it's, that's why a sun is in the shape of a sphere or a tube has balance along the way. You can put things through it, right? It's, it, it allows things to pass through it like a, like a wire, but if you cut it in the middle, it's, it's weak in the center. A plane is fantastic for things to be able to stand on and, and balance, but it's so spread out, right? That you can't do much else with it. So there are always pluses and minuses to these things. I encourage people in the community not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, not to look at centralization, centralization is inherently evil, decentralization as, you know, just uh, something that's inherently good, but to Look at history, look at biology, look at all of these things and understand that there are good and bad to both and build a hybrid system that takes the best traits of what we currently have, correctly identify the problems of the current situation and try to mitigate those problems. Right. Corporations are, are, are centralized things that have worked for a thousand years. They have certain problems. We can mitigate some of those problems without necessarily needing a DAO. A DAO can be a great thing that will open up all kinds of possibilities. Mm -hmm. But a DAO still hasn't solved a bunch of problems either. We can't order paper clips in a DAO. Everyone thinks a DAO is just like, hey, it's a smart contract. I'll send you some money. That's mm -hmm. not what a company does. A company motivates people. It inspires people. It gets them all working on the same thing. For uh, for their own for for the company's goal as opposed to their own individual goal, it it creates specialization, it creates hierarchies of order. In in a DAO, it's just everybody's the I'm we're all the Indian chief. It's the brave new world problem. I'm I'm the best of the best, and nobody wants to take out the trash. That's nice, but that's not going to scale to tens of thousands of people. We need new technologies. DAOs need to grow, and in the meantime, we can look backwards at the things that have already been done well and uh, adapt them. And learn from them. Yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of things I want to pick up um, there. Actually, we'll come on to um, sort of the future shortly. But um, if we're looking at, so you mentioned two things: so artificial intelligence and the rise of artificial intelligence, and um, the fact that it's already here and it will continue to, to improve. And there's also a project of yours um, that something that myself and, and Stig have discussed, um, which is the notion of universal basic income. And does, uh, I think one of the things that we, we're sort of grappling with and we're, we've discussed a few times is, does that sort of intersection of um, artificial intelligence, blockchain, immutability, um, smart contracts, does all of that sort of give rise to the possibility of a universal basic income that people could have mm. just by going about their daily lives? So people that are commuting um, to the office, could they yeah. earn money by providing real-time GPS data on traffic flows, on the state of the road, uh, all, all these other things? And I think you've come up with notions of you know, using your devices um, to, to power uh, different nodes, uh, randomly selected uh, nodes, um, and then you get paid whilst you're going about your daily life. You don't even have uh, awareness of that. Is that something that you think could realistically uh, be implemented and come about? Or is it more of um, a thought experiment and a, and a proposal that, um, that sounds good but may not actually be uh, implementable in reality? I, I think it absolutely can be done in reality. And I think it can come about in a number of ways. I actually think that a universal basic income created by a government is maybe the worst way to do it. Um, it's possible, but I think it's possible. You really have to end up scrapping most social services and just saying, look, here's a realistic uh, stipend for everyone on in, in my society. That's the way that it will work. But I think if you try to do it that way, people will freak out. They will absolutely lose their mind, uh, you know. Uh, the, the nature of reality is that once something exists, whether it's an entity or an organization or a budget, it does not decrease except with a fight. Uh, it does not die with except with a fight. So the best way to do it is almost by a, a side uh, 
uh, attack, right? It's like if I have a sort of video game like system where instead of having virtual money, I have crypto and I'm playing it and I'm constantly getting a drip of that money, then if or if I have a gamified application with an ecosystem of people who are paying me, you can realistically, I've already done this for. Uh, several groups, and I'm starting to do it for a few more if people are interested in this, but I've already fully laid out uh, how a gamified protocol would work so that the the money flows into different pools so that there is a a supply that is flexible based on economic statistics and uh, a series of rule sets that are kind of like an anti-cheat system within a uh, within an ecosystem that are updatable over time so that you are able to control the few cheaters you assume that there will be some cheaters just like in a video game a few people are going to write code to go do farming and uh, and get a few extra bucks that's fine you you assume that's going to be the case and you build in these kind of anti cheat rules over time so you can already do this mm-hmm. and i think that uh, people are out there are going to are, are going to catch on to this type of thing and it's going to be wonderful in fact the original concept that I had when I was working on the Jasmine Wars uh, book was I was going to do this little promotional campaign where I thought, okay, I'm just going to do a technology from the future and have slapped together a quick website and write up a white paper on it. So I thought my giant artificial intelligence, direct democracy platform that I created would be done. And then I started working on it and I'm like, I'm an engineer. I can't just slap this together in 10 minutes. So I spent a year and a half working on the damn thing, trying to solve every problem in history. Of course I had after I put it out there, I had uh, you know, 500 different programmers and 1,500 people volunteer to try to assist. And I realized I'm not a project manager, nor do I want to deal with all this stuff. So I just decided to start open sourcing my ideas. But one of the concepts I put in there was you can already solve the 51% problem. It, this is it's this is the way that you do it is you have a random election. If, if there is a, a, a way to create an identity system for someone, uh, centralized or decentralized, I, I've created a number of different decentralized ID concepts and I've worked with uh, different folks um, you know, who have uh, gone even further with it. The folks from Everest uh, ID, for instance, have, have done it, but more and more people are coming up with a decentralized ID. So if I have an ID where I have both, I'm both an, a single node and a single wallet, then I can, I can randomly elect people to be miners for a period of time. And I can also bring in a pool of, X number in case like those people just drop off the planes of the earth or they lose connectivity to the web or whatever it is. And they're just elected and automatically sorted into pools. And the bigger that the network gets, the more secure that it is. Like in other words, everyone is a miner and everyone is a node. And in that way, you're just walking along, your phone wakes up for five minutes, it does a proof of work or it does some other type of transaction, whatever else we've come up with. And suddenly you potentially have won coins or you've won fractions of coins for being in that mining pool that's automatically created within the protocol. You don't need to go do these types of things manually. You could actually build this into the protocol, which creates a small drip of income. Now, if you only have a limited set of coins or, or, or which type of coin is the best in order to create this, I don't know. Is it one that has uh, a, a fixed rate of, of, of delivery of the coins? Is it one that's deflationary? Is it one that's inflationary? I don't know which one ends up being the best, but you absolutely could create a UBI like that, plus start layering things on top of it for people doing little jobs or for, like you said, providing some type of service that they may or may not even be conscious of, and then still have the ability to work and create conscious services. Sometimes I had some folks randomly think I was talking about communism when I wrote about this. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, this is, I mean, this is like, I mean, did I, did I say this is the only money you get? And like, we're all going to be dependent on this. Like, you know, you, not bad. I mean, just sometimes people read my stuff and I, I, it feels like it goes through a portal in one ear and, and out yeah. into some weird discombobulated insane processing and comes back totally wrong. And I think like I think, bizarre world. I think there's so there's an interesting um, sort of notion that you slightly touched on, but not not as uh, overtly that is that starting to emerge and people are starting to talk about it at the moment, which is the the idea of streaming payments or streaming salaries. And that's um, so getting micro payments either by the task or we already have that sort of uh, in place, but uh, by the minute, by the hour, by the day, um, whether that's for a traditional company or for doing a number of different things. Um, do you think that's something that could take off? Because I guess the the old model of uh, a monthly salary is is quite antiquated, and you could smooth out your uh, your peaks and flows of, of cash flow throughout the month if you were paid on a more regular basis. And this AI, crypto, blockchain, uh, and all of the technology surrounding it 
may well present an opportunity to enable that in a more efficient way that, than, than the centralized uh, banking model uh, allows us to do today. I already wrote about some of this stuff and in, in, there's low hanging fruit that nobody's touching in this space because everyone wants to decentralize everything. And so you don't need to decentralize everything. If you wanted to go kill Kickstarter right now, you just go ahead and build a clone of it with standard cloud-based web technologies, but you start taking crypto as your primary payment. Already you've cut out 5% Mm-hmm. of the processing fees. So you already have an advantage in terms of a hard cost that they can't cut out. And then in addition to that, you could probably take 6% instead of the 5% that they take and still deliver more money and value back to the creators. And by the way, they can only process their transactions one time, or you look at something uh, that's like a subscription service, like a Spotify, they can only do it one time. Why? Because they can only batch it once a month to the payment processors. Whereas if I was able to pay Spotify or or, or Kickstarter uh, over a set period of time or when, a, or, or when a set set of criteria have been reached. And I just, I agree to escrow that money into a little application and it starts firing it out five times. I don't actually even care about whether it processes instantly, right? So if I'm, if I'm trying to buy coffee, yeah, I want it to process instantly. But if I'm donating money to like a another freaking board game project. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't care if it, if it closed in two days, like it can get the best possible fee on the network. And by the way, with the rise of lightning network and all these other types of payment systems is going to be cheap anyway. So who cares? So you can already, you can already do these things. And then if you build a gamified protocol on top of that, so you then go ahead and create your own coin and you start doing it as a rewards based coin on, on your, your, your centralized, um, Kickstarter. Don't even worry about decentralizing and trying to build this distributed app. When that technology is ready, you can do that and transition it. But for now, you don't have to. You cre- you create this rewards coin where you're like, okay, the the top creators get money. The people who refer people in who also donate to projects get money. Random drops to people who came in for the first time as a bonus reward. All these types of behaviors that you want to incentivize on the network, you can now give away a rewards coin. And by the way, if you start building an ecosystem on top of that. Then you have other companies that that rewards coin is good in, and all of a sudden you have a universal rewards coin as opposed to a rewards coin that's basically like a target reward or an airline reward, and it's actual money. And it, the only way for someone like Kickstarter to compete against that is to then go raise another 10, 20, 40, 50 million dollars and give it away, which would be insane. Nobody is going to do that. So I think that the crypto community is missing a ridiculous level of uh, low-hanging fruit. By the way, I've talked about these ideas to multiple people. Multiple people have said, why don't, why don't you just go raise the money and do this? Again, I just don't want to do that. I I don't, I don't, care about being an author and a futurist, writing, traveling, doing the things that I love in my life. I am happy to consult on these types of projects. I'm happy to give them away. Maybe I'll regret this later in life as, as a starving artist dying on my deathbed, but I don't think so. I think I'm going to enjoy the things that I want to do now. But when I look at people who then listen to my ideas, again, it seems to go in this year, get scrambled and come out the other side. And then they're like, well, I just built a decentralized Kickstarter and we take crypto. And I'm like, who cares? Like, the, So you, what you build is a broken version of Kickstarter. You built a crappy decentralized version because the technology is not there yet. It's still in the developing stage. It will be. We'll absolutely have federated serverless servers that are running across every single type of cloud and are totally resilient. And these servers are standard and universal. Some of them are on people's house. Some of them are running in the cloud. And we're using the cloud as a dumb compute layer and then pushing logs to the blockchain or pushing pointers to the blockchain, right? We don't have to do all this crap through the blockchain, by the way, like we can combine technologies. And and then, yes, people will build all kinds of awesome decentralized applications that we can't even imagine yet. It's not just going to be a clone of Instagram and Kickstarter and things like that. It's going to be a brand new type of application that works with the new possibilities of the technology that we have, right? I've often talked about we're going to abstract up the layer of identity and databases and storage. And now I don't have to go build my identity anymore. Like everybody, how many people have to, how many passwords do you have to remember? Because everyone had to build their own identity system. Okay, well, now we're going to abstract up to the point where you don't have to build your own identity. You're just going to consume it, and you're going to build a cool – your engineers, your 50 engineers, are going to be able to build cool shit on top of that. So we're going to build cool new stuff. But right now, the killer application is cryptocurrency, and yep. it is mm-hmm. reward system. So just build a freaking centralized clone of this crap, a web-scale technology. You can go get the O'Reilly book to figure out how to do it because it's already baked technology. Stop trying to reinvent HTML on the blockchain and Java on the blockchain and whatever the hell else and 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 Docker on the blockchain, right? And Bananas go ahead on the blockchain. and – 
Right. Yeah. Every everything on the blockchain, it's all on the blockchain. It'll work perfectly. <laughs> right. It's like it's like that Dilbert you know thing where it's like we brought in the consultant. And he's like blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. It's like yeah. he's both a genius and a and a and a guru and a god. You know, it's like it's just like, dude, come on. You know, you know those moment. You know those moments when you're watching things and then there's this sort of echo like screaming and round of applause. I'm just sitting here, sitting there with that going on in the back of my head. Going. <laughs> so. So yeah, I think we, we would tend to agree with you. I think we are um, very enthusiastic about um, the possibilities and opportunities of de uh, distributed ledger technology, decentralized systems, but not everything requires um, a decentralized system. Not everything requires a blockchain. So I think unless it's got a real rock solid use case, I think jury's out and it's and it's not needed. And that's kind of our um, overarching view. Right. Um, but I wanted to, so that's sort of, so, let me let's recap. So we started off with uh, with the beginning of humanity and global trade. We've we've cantered through at a pace to today and the near term future. Where next, Dan? Where are we going to go um, beyond this? So, what I wanted to talk to you about was how how do all these things come together and how does AI uh, progress? What kind of threats could AI pose to humanity? Will it free us or enslave us? And then let's think about, okay, transhumanism. You know, let's let's get a bit sci-fi. And uh, is there the possibility of connecting humans to computers? That human brain interface that Elon talked about um, a while back and uh, is definitely uh, in all of the sci-fi films. Um, let's let's get freaky. <laughs> All right, let's really go out there. I, I think um, Elon is, is a genius, although I have largely disagreed with him on the threat of artificial intelligence. Um, the uh, There is the book by Nick's, uh, Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence. Um, I am on record as saying that I despise that book. Uh, I hate it uh, with a passion. I think that the examples in there are largely uh, ridiculous. Uh, people are free to disagree with me in a free society. But one of the examples they use in there is the... Uh, artificial intelligence, the super intelligence that's charged with making a paperclip, paperclip factory more efficient, and that it essentially goes crazy Hal style and turns the entire known universe into paperclips. Uh, people have actually used this example seriously in a and conversation with me. I mean, that's the universal paperclip game, isn't it? I think I've, yeah. I've played that. It's, that's the most addictive game ever, but I think you end it by um, turning the universe into a paperclip. Right, because you've got sort of you've got new types of matter converter technology. You can yeah. already, if you already have <laughs> atomic printers, uh, you can do a lot more cooler things than turning the universe into paperclips. So my, when I think about that kind of thought experiment, um, or when people look at the threats of artificial intelligence, I, I look at that type of thing as utterly ridiculous. If you use that example with me, I am going to annihilate your argument and laugh because it's horrible. It's the fact is, if I, I'm a pretty smart guy. And if you tell me to go make a paperclip factory more efficient, I'm probably going to tell you to go pound sand to give it to somebody else. OK, so a super intelligence most definitively is not going to be doing this job. It's going to task it to some little tiny process that's not super intelligent, that's specialized at doing this. And it will have checks and balances in there that is not going to say, you know what I need to do? Go get control of all the atomic printers in the universe and start converting all the matter into you know, paper clips. This is ridiculous. In addition, if it's a super intelligence You'd think it would be really smart and that it might have the idea that turning the whole universe into paperclips is not a good idea. Now, again, I'm a pretty smart guy. I'm pretty sure that most people who are not that smart would also agree that turning the universe into paperclips is not a good idea. So could we argue potentially that a super intelligence, something that is really, really, really smart, might also think that's a bad idea? So I, I tend to look at these types of things. We concentrate on these ridiculous threats in artificial intelligence. I, the, the threats of artificial intelligence are much smaller, okay, and they already exist. Sentencing algorithms are a very perfect example. You have these black box, black algorithms, various places in the United States and elsewhere that say, hey, should this guy go to jail or should this guy get bail or should this guy you know, have sentencing? Mm -hmm. If you put a deep learning system on the history of most um, – justice systems, what you're going to find is the history of ingest. It's going to ingest that because it has no consciousness of its own. I worry much more about artificial intelligence controlled by sadistic, dumb, arrogant, violent humans than I will ever worry about Terminator and Hal, right? I worry about these algorithms. There's a, a book, I think, Weapons of Math Destruction, where people just assume that an algorithm is some type of magic and that it's perfect. An algorithm is really just somebody's opinion or a way of 
um, create coding a process as best they could. It's very easy to get kind of a black mirror thing because you can't actually solve the problem. So if you think of the black mirror where everybody is rating each other with a reputation system, you can't create a system for measuring happiness. Like what is happiness? I don't know. I, I just, I know when I feel it, but okay, so we'll rate everybody. And this is what programmers will do a lot of time. They'll go, well, I can't figure that out. So I'll just, if everyone's smiling, they must be happy. So eventually everyone's like, smiling all the but time but that's what they're doing clicking. in china though right they they are they are giving social credit scores if you uh, if you're sort of looking more positive and doing the right things um based on subjective rule sets that are uh, that coders programmers have put in place yeah and those those subjective rule sets are always are also rule sets of like the will of the state or the will of the, the people in power and so those things to me are are incredibly destructive um narrow artificial intelligence is killing people is incredibly destructive mm-hmm. however there's all I don't like to think of these things as binary we tend to be very black and white we tend to look at these big overarching threats as opposed to the smaller threats and i've said this a bunch of times it's why we spend you know, four trillion dollars on fighting terrorism that kills point oh 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 one percent of people, like less than I think lawnmowers did over the course of that time, and then then one in four men die of of heart disease or cancer. We spend ten billion dollars a year on that. It's like we're not very good at seeing long term threats. We like to see these big flashy threats. So to me, the the darkness is these sort of smaller threats. But there's also these tremendous possibilities for artificial intelligence, right? With these new interfaces to how we deal with reality, uh, assistants that make our life easier. If you want to go super sci-fi, I don't think that the AIs basically put us all out of a job. I think that we start moving towards becoming centaurs, with centaurs being the concept that we're sort of a merger of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. And that term comes from um, a, a term Gary Kasparov, I believe, was a part of, and then he created a tournament called Centaur Chess. So most people know that uh, Kasparov lost to IBM's Deep Blue, which we thought was a big movement in artificial intelligence, but it was really just a brute force tree search. But anyway, it beat him. And then they were, and then he was like, look, I think I have some new ideas. I want to play you again. And they're like, sorry, we folded it up, pound sand. So mm-hmm. he started, he started a contest the next year called Centaur Chess, where you could enter uh, an artificial intelligence as a human or an artificial intelligence human team. What's very interesting is that a team of, uh, I think it was two or three non-expert, non-grandmaster chess players, plus an artificial intelligence bested everyone else, including the straight AIs and the grandmaster humans. And the reason is because when they are working together, things are more powerful. And the reason that that's very important is that people tend to think of artificial intelligence as a singular thing, Mm -hmm. one type of thing. And what they generally think of as a human intelligence. So we think C-3PO or or, or whatever is is anything that can mimic humanity. But artificial intelligence is highly specialized. And one of the examples in the article that I took that – concept of centaur from i think it came out of mit so i forget the author's name but google it centaur um uh, and artificial intelligence and what he said is a squirrel intelligence is a very specialized type of intelligence and a squirrel is good at being a squirrel and if you've ever tried to keep a squirrel out of your garden uh, a squirrel's intelligence is very adept at getting around it so you might be a super intelligence quote unquote but have a trouble keeping a squirrel out of your garden so what we're going to have is this little constellation of specialized intelligences, narrow intelligences that are are working with ours. Now, whether that's a human brain interface and neural laces, as Elon likes to call it, or we start to get these kind of little black box Mm. chips or microprocessors on our spinal cords or just embedded into our system, or whether it's just a watch in the early days with the little pinprick, all the type of stuff I put into my science fiction, we get to a point where the artificial intelligences and humans continually work together Mm-hmm. And, and and do things better and better. And that is where I think this stuff is going. We will certainly have a disruption of, of jobs and, and things in the short term, but that is the short term, right? Over the long term, I believe artificial intelligence will create an explosion of new types of jobs. Because every time we've had a new leap in complexity, a new level of technology, all we're able to focus on is all the jobs we're going to lose. It's like, man, if we only had all those loom weaving jobs back, where would society be? Right? We'd be we would be <laughs> so much better off if if we didn't destroy those loom weaving jobs. Right? Except no, we wouldn't because now I get a rug at IKEA that was made by a machine, and I'm and it's awesome. And by the way, there are still people who specialize in making amazing rugs. We get artisans 
who go back and learn the ancient art mm-hmm. of crafting a rug. And by the way, now they can charge a you know, a hundred thousand dollars for yeah. that incredible rug instead of cranking out Ikea level rugs for everyone. So uh, it's like, you have these minor disruptions. I'm not saying they're not painful. I'm not saying we don't have to deal with these in society with things like, you know, universal basic income, which we talked about earlier, or other types of ways to earn passive income or other ways to retrain people and things. But the plus side is that after you come out of that pit, you get this explosion of new types of jobs that we can't even begin to imagine. Correct. Uh, and the, and the the point that you make there that I absolutely love is basically the thought of kind of nudge AI as an enhancement for a human versus the complete like super AI because the the space that I get to around like the singularity and the point that where that we may get to is that when an intelligent force gets that intelligent the thing that they're going to do is seek more knowledge and at the moment knowledge is very much restricted to what is within our atmosphere. So the likelihood is that if you end up with an intelligence of that force, they're going to work out how to leave and they will leave. Whereas what we will be left with is that is the AI that supports and nudges us either. And in some ways that will be bad because we're already seeing it, how AI is used to nudge people in bad directions. But it will also nudge people in good directions. And as you say, will will make you a prolific squirrel hunter. Um, I guess the challenge there is. Or the thing that I keep on coming back to is kind of the concept of the brave new world, which we which lots of people know. Um, which is if is AI not going to gr- drive a greater disparity between those that have and those that don't have on uh, uh, just on the basis of the discussion that we've had? Look, I, I the future is not set, right? I mean, I'm going to quote Terminator ironically here, and there's no future for what we make, right? There's no, there's no fate for what we make. Um, and so that's a pretty ironic quote. But I would say I always do what I call a Monte Carlo analysis of the future. And if you've ever seen kind of Monte Carlo analysis of stock where it has all the different possibilities branching out, but there's a couple of stronger branches, the, the, the dystopian version is, is great for science fiction. I mean, it's great. It's the, the, the people of the hats world, as it's called in the sci-fi world, where it's like it's much easier to create an all sand world, an all water world. An all world where everyone wears the same colored red hat, where all the aliens look exactly the same. That's really nice because it like cuts down on like budget and like you can make the Star Trek level alien where you just slap a ridge on his head and like you don't and that's an alien. You don't actually have to have him have, you know, eight different types or no head at all, plus like eight different kinds of detachable limbs, which is much harder to do with special effects, right? So and but also we do, the possibilities of the future or there's certainly binary ones where there's uh, just all good or all, or all gag, but they're really outliers. They're, the, they're the, the farthest part of the bell curve on this, this analysis. The future is usually somewhere in between where there's both good and bad, right? And people tend to focus on one side or the other. There was the famous talk by, I think it's Hans Rowling, who's a famous statistician who died. And if you haven't seen, if you Google the greatest uh, statistics you've ever seen, he kind of does it like a, ESPN show where he's showing graphs of all of the history of, of, of time from all these like public statistics he pulled up and he's like, Oh, and look, you know, this country makes a terrible decision on, a, uh, you know, on this project and they start to go backwards in, in their economic value. And all of a sudden they, you know, the government changes and look, their prosperity is rising. And what you see is this constant rise over time. And you also start to see a breakdown of these common concepts that like there is a bigger divide between rich and poor. There is, there is also a bigger middle class. There is also more people who are able to break themselves out of poverty and do something different than have ever before in the past. You want to talk about a 1%? Go back to China at like 200 years ago when five guys had all the money. Go back to feudal Europe where, you know, for, where six feudal lords have it and everyone was a peasant and, and had a lifespan of, of 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, right? The, the best – the the most the richest and most powerful people at the time the kings and queens is is a great example i think they talked about this in sapiens uh, you know one of the kings of, of england i think had 15 kids whereas basically 12 of them died so those are the people who had the best possible care and upbringing or whatever and they still you know died out this type of thing is we have progressed in society as much as we you know it's two steps forward one step back we definitely have People at the top have more money, people at the bottom have less, but there's also a whole huge chunk in the middle. And what Hans Rawling said is, with the rise of 24-hour news media where there's not enough to cover, where humans are naturally wired to look at 
big, horrible threats instead of long-term threats, where our sort of natural inclination is to look for the doomsday because that is a survival mechanism. We are fear-based creatures. Fear is the fire under the ass of humanity that gets us building rockets and moving forward, right? We tend to look at the worst case scenario because if I know the worst case scenario, I can survive. But the worst case scenario generally doesn't play out. The, if you look at the statistics, right, you look at something um, like what's the fellow who wrote Black Swan and um, uh, some of the other um, you know, books like that, Fool by Randomness, I can't think of his name offhand. But, uh, you know, he said that, like, you look at history and you think, God, we've been at war the whole time. Actually not. Like, we've had these big outbreaks of war. But there's a whole chunk of peace, peace in between that is actually the vast majority of history, but that's boring to write about because it's not conflict. You don't, <laughs> you don't have a novel unless there's conflict. That's literally the definition of drama. No conflict equals – go ahead and try to write a novel where you wake up in the morning, nothing happens, you're happy, you got your coffee, you screw your wife, and you go to bed. Right? Like that's not a story. The story is, oh, shit, I fought with my wife. I couldn't get my Starbucks, and you know my kid was uh, just kicked out of college. That's a story. Drama is a story. But the fact is it causes us to overlook the fact that in many ways society is progressing. It's a spiral, right, a spiral staircase. We're going up, right, and, and we're getting better in certain places. And Hans Rawlings said on an interview, I have an entire shoe. And, uh, and he was talking to the media and he's like, you guys keep pointing at the bottom of the shoe and saying it's the entire shoe. It is not the entire shoe. But if I keep pointing at the bottom of the shoe and I keep showing you the bottom of the shoe all the time, you will begin to think, at least half of the population will begin to think that it is the entire shoe. It is not the entire shoe. Artificial intelligence, cryptocurrencies, all of these developments will be both good and bad. But the vast majority of society is progressing in ways that are tremendously exciting. Look at this. You and I are sitting around for an hour in the middle of the day talking about interesting shit. Okay. <laughs> I mean, what, what, you know, what was happening in the past? Like, you know, do you think you, my, you got out my, of the factory at the, after your 12 hour shift and, and, and got to sit around talking about cool shit for half the, you know, for an hour? I don't think so. So my I, life I, was so dull before this. <laughs> I think I think most people listening think we're either drunk or high. So um, um, yeah, it, um, but you raise an interesting point about the shoe. So I think final point, before, final sort of uh, discussion topic before we finish. If we can only see the bottom of the shoe, how do we know there is another part of the shoe? Are we living in a simulation? We are led to believe, and the evidence that we have um, today suggests that physics, time, chemistry, uh, mathematics are sort of universal laws and truths that we know. Um, is it possible that they are just the equivalent of pixels of um, computer science uh, rules and algorithms uh, that keep the likes of The Sims and SimCity characters penned in their games? Are they the rule, the rule set that keep us? Um, within our own simulation? Well, this is a huge rabbit hole to end on, but so let's say that, um, sure, anything is possible, but the, the question is, if you wanna get really funky on this case, you wanna know how far knowledge goes, then go pick up Jed McKenna, go pick up my uh, three of my favorite books, and by favorite, I mean the most destru mind-destructive books you will ever read uh, that will destroy your entire worldview and then recreate it, uh, spiritually enlightenment, spiritual enlightenment, the damnedest thing, spiritually incorrect enlightenment, and spiritual warfare. I used to never recommend these books because they're like sort of a spiritual nuclear weapon, but um, it's it's the type of thing that's really just a thought experiment. And one of the experiments is, you know, what is enlightenment? Does it exist? And he comes to the concept that it's truth realization. And so what is truth? And he has this whole uh, concept called spiritual autolysis. Autolysis is, is programmed self-destruction of cells. And so it is a cell that is essentially eating itself. And so you do this exercise where you ask, where you're designed to write down one thing that is true. Now, if you want to really do this exercise for, you know, it'll take you about two years. You go ahead and start writing down something that you think is true. You're immediately going to say something like, you know, does the sun rise in the, uh, the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening. And you go, well, shit, how do I really know that? Well, like, you know, do, do, is there, first of all, have I already 
decided that there's an independent son that's outside of me or or is there just consciousness i am and i can't actually tell the difference between the two how would i prove such a thing that you guys are actually separate entities and not just figments of my imagination or non-player characters in my dream set and if you want to go back further the concept of a simulation is already a concept of maya in in buddhism or you go back to the hindus who thought of the entire world as an illusion we were just using different terms for the same thing that essentially all of this stuff around us is just a dream state and that nothingness is the actual reality now how do you conceive of nothingness well you can't because it's nothing it's not black or white it's not up or down it's not you or me it's not dead or alive it's nothing what do you mean by nothing nothing that's what i mean like there is no you there's no me there's no afterlife there's no anything after we're gone uh there's just nothing and so you don't actually know joy or pain you're not in a joyous or painful place there's no such thing as joy or pain there is nothing and then it the then you get to something like Taoism, where the one thing becomes the two, which becomes the four, which becomes the many things, the ten thousand things. So that is the concept where from nothing or ex nihilo, right? Out of nothingness comes something. The Big Bang, there was nothing. Then all of a sudden, there's a bunch of stuff. Or out of Taoism, there's one big old thing, uh, and then all of a sudden, there's a bunch of stuff. So you and I. Uh, potentially are nothing but dreams or non-player characters or simulation or whatever term you want to use. And there's actually no way to prove any of it. There is no evidence because if we were in a simulation or a dream, how would we measure it except in the dream? Therefore, we'd be measuring it with dream tools. Therefore, we would be in the dream and measuring it with things that are in the dream. Therefore, it's impossible to do. So the actual only thing that we can ever actually come to understand is the word I am. So we know that I know that I exist. I have no idea whether you exist. You know that you exist. You have no idea whether I exist. Maybe we have overlapping bubble realities where we both kind of exist at the same time and there's a Venn diagram where our, our realities touch. Um, and then the other thing you can know is that truth exists. In other words, there are true things. So truth with a capital T exists. In other words, there are rule sets within this game or this simulation or this Maya or this... Uh, dream stuff that we are existing in and that is if you walk out in the street tomorrow and you think that you're immune to dying and that you won't be hit by a car go ahead and test that and you will get hit by a car so the rule exists and that is true from the standpoint of of the fact that you're a biological entity that will die but outside of the biological entity do you does anything true exist in other words uh, pain is bad for the physical body dying is bad for the physical body living is good but outside of that if you take the construct outside of the, the physical biological body what is true is it true that the ocean is good or bad is there any concept of good or bad to the ocean does the ocean change or exist it just rolls in and out and does the thing that it's done and if there are no humans there are no consciousness that have a concept of good or bad. Does good or bad exist? If there is nothing to observe the ocean or decide when the dam breaks and drowns all of the farmers underneath it, if there's no one there to decide that that is good or bad, is it good or bad or did it just happen? The universe blows things up all the time. It destroys entire worlds. It, it wipes out puppies and kittens. It, it, uh, it has supernovas and it recreates stars all the time. Is that good or bad? Does it exist? If you look out into the universe, can you even prove that the universe exists or do you have to flip it outside of itself and come back to the I am? So now I'm going to bring you back to reality. I just took you through uh, the Bhagavad Gita and a whole bunch of like crazy Krishna level, um, God level consciousness and sanity. And I'm going to bring you back to a very important thing. Stop worrying about it. It's just an intellectual game. And here's the best phrase that you will ever learn. Before enlightenment, there is the mountain. During enlighten, enlightenment, there is no mountain. After enlightenment, there is the fucking mountain again. In other words, after you've gone through this crazy thought experiment, <laughs> and you've gone out, and you've raked sand, and you've traveled to Nepal, and you've figured out all this shit, and you eat vegan food, and then you, and you've chanted, and you've done yoga, and stood on your head, then after that, you're just going to chop wood and carry buckets of water you're gonna be right back into the same body and reality that you always were and you're still gonna die so the mountain is still there doesn't really matter whether we're a simulation or not it's a really nice fun game to play but there's really no way to prove it so don't bother i mean that that was an okay response um <laughs> you did you did relatively well there dan um <laughs> 
Should we end there? Yeah, no, I need... Uh, if, if it's all right. Can we just... We, we've got three or four wow. minutes. I just need a couple of hours to nap. Uh, if we could... Um, yeah, We're definitely that. getting you back on, by the way. We have to unpick... <laughs> we have to unpick some of these things. So I think also... The one... I think hopefully the one thing you will find with us in the future, if our future us progress at the same time is that the stuff that goes in one ear and goes out the other ear that you often get with other people will not happen with us. <laughs> yeah, so we're in the basement, as I call it, the unconsciousness will go to work and you'll have all kinds of questions, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah Look, already do. <laughs> um, that, was, uh, that was fascinating, Dan. And I think we succeeded in our objective of starting at the beginning of time and finishing in the futile future uh, where nothing <laughs> matters and everything is nothing. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh. Uh, one final question before we go. This is the Crypto and Grill podcast. Um, bringing it back to a sense of reality and atoms and taste and senses uh, and chaos. Um, the whole of the Bitcoin Twitter sphere, everybody involved in crypto and, uh, and blockchain technology has all been invited to your house for a party to celebrate Bitcoin going to the moon finally. Um, Maybe one day. But, um, Dan, what are you going to cook and put on the barbecue to keep everybody happy and satisfied? Uh, most of crypto Twitter is a, uh, uh, is a, a carnivore. Um, what are you, uh, how are you going to keep everyone satiated? Well, if you do a meta-analysis of all diets, you will find that vegetables are all, all of them, including on uh, things like paleo and primal. So a no diet will tell you that vegetables are bad. So there's going to be a ton of grilled wonderful vegetables uh, with uh, garlic and uh, oil, which are going to be delicious. Uh, we'll get a ton of asparagus in there. We'll dry out some eggplant with a little salt and we'll cook that on there. However, I have always said in my thought experiment that if I could have one food uh, for all of existence – and uh, that I was on, had on a de desert island, that it would be lobster with butter. Now, several people have told me that you don't get butter. And I said, this is a magical fantasy. I get that butter. Okay, <laughs> so deal with it. And uh, I would have gout because uh, I would just be eating shellfish eternally. However, I would happily have that gout because, man, lobster is amazing. So we're going to grill up that lobster. We're going to humanely kill the, the, the poor little uh, guy first uh, and instead of just boiling him alive, which I think is, is horrifying. Uh, and we're going to have a whole bunch of uh, wonderful vegetables go along with it. And uh, we're probably going to have a dance on the beach and a swim in the river and a lie on the hammock after that. And we are going to enjoy ourselves with some wonderful music. Amazing. And if you're enlightened, there is no gout anyway. So <laughs> that's <go>. right. <laughs> there is no mountain. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Dan, this has been fantastic. Thank you for, for making time with us. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. <laughs> you are the resistance. Thanks, everyone.